Shalom en Sia Bonga en Dumelang en Good morning and good morning for um, uh, just for good measure. I uh, wanted to say thank you and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, lovely to uh, to actually uh, uh, back up what uh, what Fora has already said, so that makes it uh, much easier for me. By the way, I'll have to yeah uh, just uh, make sure I stay with uh, with my own program here. Um, so so really privileged to be here and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, but I'm, I must also say at the outset, and uh, sorry, Vili, but there, there was a there was a slight deviation from the original agenda point. I think it, it mentioned something about co-generation. I thought, uh, well, Fora is the expert <laughs> because uh, it has not been uh, my space of late. So um, slightly changed to, uh, shall we say, co-generation opportunities. It links to what Fora said. Perhaps maybe a few other additional inputs on the macro sort of picture meaning uh, learning a little bit of what, what is happening globally. So again, maybe uh, quite contextual, so maybe not that practical for you, but nevertheless thought uh, that we should go there. And then secondly, I have to, I have to, I have to use the opportunity simply because I wear the official hat um, um, for most of the time, still with uh, uh, DTIC, where we manage a range of incentives, about five billion a year. And some of them relate to, to this discussion. So I thought the second co part would be possible co funding, um, which I thought to cover at the end, Vili. So hopefully, hopefully um, that would be uh, acceptable for you if we, if we change the, uh, the topic a little bit. So, from uh, my perspective, just a quick disclaimer. Yeah, so disclaimer and perhaps confession. So, uh, similar to Fora, I do not fully understand the Prado industry or the entire value chain, now, except that I love pommes frites, so your end products, I mean, when it's really fresh and crispy, uh, that's about it. Um, from a personal perspective, no vested interest in any particular technology, uh, albeit that there are a few that are close to heart, simply because we've been involved in the industrialization of some of them, some are related to, to hydrogen, by the way. <clears throat> so, but. But no real vested interest. And I think thirdly, so, so please don't take any of our ideas and just go write a check tomorrow and go say, well, let's purchase some of this technology. Uh, I think as Fora quite correctly stated, I th I th it looks like there's quite a bit of work still required to, to shall we say, engineer a solution for a, for a particular application, but hopefully at scale, meaning uh, adding multiple pieces to it for it to become um, cost effective. So, so just that last, uh, last bit as well, please. Um, so therefore, the ideas we, that, uh, that we'll share with you really is just on a macro level, uh, plus a few, uh, few options strategically. I think whilst, we, uh, whilst we're waiting, that's why we always have a paper version, uh, we were thinking to uh, just quickly go back one step and just quickly explain what's happening on a macro level, because uh, Fora said it, but I, I think we don't fully appreciate the extent, shall we say, the velocity in engineering. We, we, we love talking about these sort of things. Um, uh, they were just simply the pace at which uh, the energy landscape is changing. So, for that reason, one would want to suggest that whatever the way forward um, points to, that that one just be mindful of the fact that that rate of change will have to be factored in in whatever one plans to do in future. So, depending on where the industry wants to go, from a competitiveness point of view, as a collective or individually then to configure solutions that'll, that'll uh, assist it to do that. Simply because others and other value chains, I'm sure, are doing exactly the same thing globally. So, and, and I would imagine in time to come, you would like to, to, to uh, compete globally. So therefore, this, this energy discussion is quite important. I saw this morning on, on one of the billboards, was it five rand a kg, is it? Would that be? Yeah. Is it more? Okay, so anyway, I was thinking so of, of whatever that number is, five or ten or six or whatever, so what, what component would constitute energy costs? It's just becoming a major competitive advantage or potential, shall we say, weapon or, or instrument in, in the box of an entire value chain uh, to then in the future be, become a bit more competitive. Uh, so then uh, we'll, we'll, I'll just quickly add a few, oh, by the way, the other disclaimer, just a few personal observations, and please do not uh, consider those to be the official viewpoint of DTI. It's simply a, a few that uh, we've picked up when Willie phoned and started to read up a bit on this topic. 
um, I started to, to, to pick up on a few themes. So uh, one or two of the observations would be, would be mine, uh, my own. And then uh, certainly to the end, uh, let us also just try and bring a bit, bit of good news to, to just indicate that there are a few incentives, DTI, believe it or not, that, um, that could possibly be part of the solution going forward. Not just for your industry, but obviously across all industries uh, in South Africa. So just as a brief recap, that's essentially where we come from. So I have to use, uh, misuse the time a little bit, really sorry about that, um, because of the official head. But uh, where we, where we uh, uh, our day job is mostly within what we call industrial finance, meaning that is a entire, um, shall we say, division, unit, business unit, uh, the DCIC, that, that exclusively just focuses on industrial finance, meaning co-funding in various sectors. So for some, it may, if, for some of you, it would be the first time that you hear about it. Um, as, as has happened to me five years ago, I didn't even know that, uh, that uh, this sort of money or, or funding was available. But uh, nevertheless, it's focused on providing co-funding for industrialization across all manner of value chains, um, in, in short. And if you look at the breakdown, and with that I'm just about to close on the, on the quick intro on DTI, uh, it's, so it's spread across various so-called clusters, uh, manufacturing being a big one. You would find industries such as agro-processing and automotive, a very big one. As you know, without DTI support, I, I would imagine we would have a much less uh, vibrant automotive industry. So, so DTIC is a very, very active player there. Um, a range of competitiveness uh, enhancement incentives, uh, a number of uh, global business service ones, export support, a whole range of it, and then obviously a very big one, the Black Industrialist Incentive, which really is all, all about adding more value to whether it's something that grow on, on on, on top of soil or something extracted underground, um, that's really where that one is focused on. In other words, the value adding part of it. And then uh, some innovation ones, which really I think is the touch point as well for today, as, as I think Fora mentioned a bit earlier. Quite a bit of innovation is still to happen um, and potentially a bit of co-funding for those that are, that are brave enough. Those that have seen the movie Braveheart would, would possibly know, I mean, maybe get that picture. So it requires a bit of bravery, but also a bit of a pioneering spirit. So in that space, yeah, then, then maybe two of the incentives could be quite relevant uh, to, to those players. Um, almost done with the DTI intro. Uh, typically, these incentives are provided across all these sectors. Uh, so you would know them quite well. So all, all, the, all the mainstream industrial uh, arenas that, that uh, drive, the, drive the economy. In this particular context, obviously, um, agro-processing. There's a dedicated incentive just for agro-processing, by the way. Um, and then uh, the other touch points, obviously, uh, also indicated here somewhere. Uh, clean, clean technology and energy, it relates to the innovation bit that I just spoke about, which we'll expand a bit on later when we have time. Um, and then, yeah, so I think that covers it. So from a sectoral point of view, across all sectors, really, that's the, the playing field for DTI. And, <clears throat> excuse me, generally when, when it co-funds industrial activity, it does so because it either wants to then uh, create uh, new employment opportunities or further exports uh, for the, from that particular enterprise um, or sector and obviously wants to see industrialization, localization, one of the very, very big themes at the moment, which is a global one, which is all about um, many companies, well, globally, the talk is deglobalization, so it means everybody, well, put bluntly, everybody for, for themselves in a way, but at a, at a country and, and regional perspective. So in our case, Africa is obviously our, the, the big focus, so the entire continent. So from a localization point of view, whether you talk the next generation um, battery storage technologies, that's really the focus. So many of these funding instruments are all geared towards furthering that, that specific agenda. I'm uh, using up the time, I suppose. So on the macro, macro view, I think um, Ford already explained a bit but I uh, just wanted to perhaps take you back to what is happening globally. If you just look at clean energy, so this is according to the um, International Energy Agency, currently spending $2.4 trillion US just on, on clean energy globally at the moment. Um, that, that's really where, where the world's going. 
Um, so that, that's a, a massive amount. I, I don't know whether, it's, whether the Davi is here or one of the economists could perhaps um, do the calc, but that, that, that'll mean something like 20 times our current GDP, um, the entire South Africa. Um, that would equate to what uh, equate what what people are spending on the clean clean energy uh, sort of domain globally. Just reinforcing the point that it's not just about solar; it's about the the entire ecosystem of various uh, energy generation technologies. And so clearly, there's a there's a race, I think, on the go for elect electrons because ultimately that's what you're chasing and that's what pay people are paying for. And for me, another very interesting indicator is simply the amount of R and D or innovation that's happening globally. So uh, similar number, so 160 billion dollars US allegedly at the moment being devoted this is by the way invested by corporate and also public sector interestingly globally uh, 40 40 billion so that would be say a quarter coming from public sector uh, the rest all coming from private sector so meaning private corporations all seeing the, f the future so we, we were thinking we got low shedding issues but I think <laughs> the uh, many other countries are really thinking ahead and saying, okay, but what comes after uh, the way that we have known the, the ecosystem for generating electrons? So that's an interesting, uh, I think, uh, number to, to, keep, uh, to keep in mind. And as per Fora's previous point, there's also an interesting drive globally for collaborating uh, across technology platforms. And it, it, and, and then therefore exchange of technology in certain spaces. And, and it's in here that one sees hydrogen emerging as, as quite an interesting one. So everything related to hydrogen, yes, hydrogen fuel cell, um, uh, electricity generation, yes, but also storage, but also uh, for transportation options. And I think that's why it's sort of colored in. This is one of these slides, the International Agen uh, Energy Agency, again, um, putting it reasonably center, if you'd like, um, also being a feed source in chemical uh, manufacturing and processing, which again is something that feeds back into your industry. So, so an interesting trend uh, emerging and it looks like this particular agenda it would, is, is not going to be overturned anytime soon. I think locally, Fora already did that, so maybe I should just um, maybe skip this slide, but but just simply to, to indicate that, that South Africa already has, a, has an interesting uh, current mix of, of renewables, um, albeit still dominated with, with, by coal. So one can see that there are all sorts of plans, um, and so typically this came from a report where, where they're looking at new capacity to be procured across the various so-called rene so renewable technologies, about five or six of them. Um, and so... Perhaps no, no need. To, yeah, no, I think it's a bit small for you to read the details, but I think Fora mentioned some of that, some of that, those numbers. Interesting to note that you'll see most of it uh, popping out from hydro and the storage technologies, which he also mentioned, and then obviously um, solar, which which is known. Um, then wind. That's so. Uh, wind is typically so that uh, that big one. Sorry. So that's the third, fourth, last column. You can see all the greens. Uh, that, that's really the additional capacity being planned um, coming from wind. And then to the far right-hand side, which really is the interesting one and the one that I think Fora referred to uh, earlier. So this is sort of the blind spot, in my view, of, of making use of existing waste product across value chain. So you, biofuels and, and biomass, et cetera, et cetera. Still a minuscule uh, contribution to the overall uh, renewable composition in South Africa. But uh, nevertheless, even officially planned for... Um, so by you know by by the authorities or the powers that be. So back to the technology one, and <clears throat> I hope we we <clears throat> will not be um, uh, shall we say uh, diverting too much from uh, what what Forrest said. But if if you think about the technologies available, you, you need to just quickly picture this: that it's all about uh, technologies specifically configured for generating power as well as for producing power, that's a second category as per the, shall we say, the international view on where energy is going. And then the storage one, which Fora mentioned. Then there are obviously two others as well, transport, and there's also uh, 
Um, there's also one for infrastructure, and there's also carpet abatement, which I'm not going to go to because that's a completely different debate, and some of us may completely disagree with that one. But um, suffice it to say, if you look at the generation side, uh, keep, keeping in mind you've got these three blobs of types of technologies. Um, I, I, quick, I went on the web website uh, last Friday and um, when looking through the various technologies that, uh, that are available at, at the moment, they all rate it in terms of a TR level, so that means technology readiness level. So that ranges anything from uh, zero or one up to 11. 11 then constituting something, as Forrest said, a well, well uh, uh, proven technology and been rolled out many times. Uh, even bankers in, understand them and uh, um, so easy, uh, or easier funded than, than most others. And then you are seeing a few interesting ones popping up on the list again. Um, for instance, wind, hydropower, as he correctly said, uh, clearly globally, this is a global picture, globally be the one that, that, is, that is currently preferred. Um, hydrogen, and then a very interesting one, heat pumps as well, uh, For uh, that, that seems to be making great advances globally. So um, those close to infrastructure and building uh, spaces. And then, yeah, do not uh, discard nuclear. It's popping up on the list. So these are just average numbers that I personally calculated from, from all the various technologies that they list, because it's just too many to reflect here. So nuclear at about 7.8 at the moment. So here we're talking uh, SMR, so small modular reactors. So that space. Um, Obviously, um, not next year, in the next five or ten years, you'll see a few of those in South Africa. I'm actually convinced of that. Yeah, on the right-hand side, for those that haven't seen uh, this technology readiness scale thing that people talk about, but this is how they rate the readiness of, of technology globally. Um, they, there's just a small snippet. I'm not going to read through all of it. But essentially, Devon means uh, it's very stable. Everybody understands it. You can just copy paste. You act, may, maybe go even to build builder's warehouse and buy it and go and install it. So that's on the generation side. On the production side, similar technologies are emerging. emerging. So, for I mentioned it, bio, uh, bioethanol, uh, natural gas from autothermal reforming. That seems to be globally uh, also an interesting space uh, for it. Then again, interesting hydrogen as well. If one had to prioritise them. And then, yes, bio, meth, methane and biomethane as well. So meaning the, these are then energy sources that, that, can, that can be generated during uh, production processes or, or where, in your case, a lot of energy has already been invested in producing the raw material and, and now you have this, this additional window. On the storage side, uh, uh, summarized on the right-hand side, you'll see many more light greens and greens, simply meaning there seems to be many more technologies that are rapidly coming to the fore as, an, as alternatives to lithium iron. Obviously, there are different schools to this, and you're right, I'm not a lithium iron school person. I think there's, there's <laughs> much, much better, much less costly technologies available. Anyway, that's a discussion from the day. Re redox flow batteries, certainly. It's, um, it's absolutely on the horizon. As we speak, they are testing some of these vanadium flow batteries in our, in, in our country, some of it, at, as Forrest said, at grid scale. Absolute, for me, no-brainer. Why? Because we, we sit with the world's bulk of vanadium resources. So it, it's just the next thing, next thing to happen. Compressed air is a very interesting one. So if you think truly renewable, uh, a few companies in our country, small, but uh, they've started to innovate in this space. One or two, I've just heard two weeks ago, uh, starting to, in fact, export these small compressed air plants to Australia. So... Again, so South Africans solving issues whilst we, whilst we are speaking here today, which, which is wonderful. So that then, and then you mentioned the salts, and again, hydrogen pops up there as well, a pretty high, or reasonably high um, readiness level, 11. So already well understood globally. Yeah, they could be here and there some, here and there some compression issues trying to, to retain it in, in containers. But that then on the, um, on the storage side, just a few observations, which I thought before we, uh, before we start uh, closing, Billy, we still have time, right? Good. So um, maybe it's just summarizing what Fora as well said, but a few of my personal observations reading through what is available and where, where things are going and, and where we see uh, some of the, the financial flows into new technologies is um, 
is this fact that he, he did mention it, and we, do, we, we saw the figures a bit earlier, the, the massive shifts that are happening. And uh, this is not going to go away. So I, I would imagine the best thing to do is to really start planning for it in whatever one's plans are across an entire value chain, for that matter. Because what, you, what you're trying to do is you're hopefully trying to configure uh, an entire value chain to be much more competitive globally, meaning you're going to have to then think uh, much more carefully as to what to deploy where and what sort of mix. Um, and I think, as you said, for us, so, so more collectively so than, than just as individual, shall we say, almost sub-optimized versions of trying to generate enough energy for one's operations. So that's, that's a clear trend. If you look at the International Agen uh, Energy Agency, by the way, very, very good space to go quickly catch up on, on uh, what's happening globally. If you look at that one and based on, uh, well, relates to the previous slide, you'll find uh, they, they have about seven subsectors in there of energy. 32 of them core, uh, core technologies and about 90, is it 90, 90? Um, uh, technology sitting under it. And if you look on their website, about 500 uh, prototype projects being, uh, being commissioned as we speak from small modular reactors through to any of the other new technologies we spoke of. So a massive scale of development um, globally. And yes, and one or two of those in South Africa, uh, well, possibly emanating from South Africa, for instance, the vanadium flow battery testing happening um, at one or two of um, ESCOM's facilities. I think the other one that you also did mention, for, for me, if, if I just try and sit back and say, but what's happening at a, at a, at a macro level, clearly this before the meter investment in renewables is, is happening. And maybe there's a small window of opportunity, because we, we, we don't know what regulators may do uh, come 10 years from now. So I think this is the precise and exact space to then invest heavily in, in w what some people are to, uh, calling before the meter, meaning so in your space, uh, if need be, not necessarily tied into the grid. Um, you see this in many of the private organizations in our, uh, in our country, and I think mining industry taking the lead. Uh, you would have seen some figures from uh, Anglo recently as well. What they're planning, with the, already installed 680 megawatt of their own uh, renewable uh, power sources, planning 5,000, um, they, they said, in the next decade, meaning uh, they, they also quoted 52% of their total energy consumption, in other words, coming from renewables, which they then personally invest in. Uh, and this is one of the industries that are that are very aggressively pursuing this trend. Meaning, uh, if, whether whether it's the hydrogen truck running at the Mohalakwena mine in uh, in in Lipopo, where because they typically making or connecting those dots between hydrogen generator and, side, and then uh, also fueling the trucks running on site, closing that loop, and then building for themselves an ecosystem that, in my view, would be a bit more sustainable than, than bits and pieces of, of, the, of the existing known technologies that we have. Um, so, yeah, the, the, uh, the point with that is that uh, I think this whole thing of what is sustainable or not, uh, one should be careful to just assume that, that something like a wind tower uh, or wind turbine, for that matter, or, or solar panels, for that matter, are, are truly... Um, uh, well, they are re they're classified as renewable, but whether they're truly sustainable over the next 20, 30 years, I doubt. <laughs> I think we're seeing these other new technologies emerging at such a pace that um, we may find um, a lot of landfill sites filled with solar panels, panels as far as you as far as you can you can see for kilometres. So, but that's just a personal view. Yeah, and I think we just spoke about this uh, this issue that at the moment there seems to be a scramble for for electrons. So, meaning that the Many solutions are created without considering perhaps the neighbor, perhaps considering a broader ecosystem or considering an entire value chain, simply because everybody's got to find a solution now and one understands that. But, but in itself, it, it also could become a bit self-defeating in the sense that, that one would then be um, deploying selectively some technologies that seem to be ready now, that seem to be fine for now, but 10 years from now, the same discussion is had, or 20 years from now. And I think that's something perhaps one wants to plan to, to avoid in future. Um, yeah, localization I mentioned previously, there's a big drive. So it's also within South Africans, um, or South Africa's focus to, to localize any of these technologies to whatever extent possible. Um, so, so that's also an interesting and, and uh, 
and great one. And then uh, on the financial ecosystem side, um, I have one or two last slides. Maybe I'll skip this, uh, this slide because uh, Fora already mentioned quite a bit on the battery side. Simply to mention that um, for me, red flag, uh, uh, what's it, uh, 96 or, or yeah, what was it now, 69% nowadays uh, of lithium iron batteries coming from China. We have global supply chain issues globally, so you, you can you can make your own judgment as to where prices potentially could go for that storage technology, and hence I think there's space for one to consider alternatives to it um, in future. On the issue of the value chain, and that's simply as I as I did confess, do not understand your industry, um, um, Vili. But if, if I look at all those previous technologies and I look at the, shall we say, the various or, or the elements across your value chain, clearly for me, there they, they are more than one choices. And I think that, that now becomes the dilemma. That, that becomes the, the challenge, I think, is to be able to, to figure out what best suits this entire value chain, whether it's across generation, production, storage, or even transportation technologies, which uh, we just spoke to uh, a few of them. There are so many of them, but without the figures at hand, it will be difficult to, to try and pinpoint um, what that, that mix would look like. But I think that requires perhaps a bit of, a bit of uh, um, attention and energy, excuse the pun, uh, uh, going forward to try and understand that picture across the entire value chain. Because as, as Forrest said, I think then it becomes much more of a, of a global, more strategic view on what would constitute or what would bring synergy across the entire energy generation ecosystem but within your whole value chain if that makes sense so almost there uh, second last point because we are bound to to and have to at least um, expose you to some of the incentives uh, at the DTI that may be relevant here some of you may have come across this model or not but uh, if, if you generally look at the the sort of domain of known and unknowns, and I think that's really where this discussion is going. There are quite a few unknowns. The 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 areas where the science is still busy trying to understand the knowables and trying to make sense of hidden and complex facts and data, and it's typically in those places that uh, I know it's a bit small for you, but uh, if you look at down at the bottom, that's really sort of the left far, uh, you know, the the, the broader sort of circle, where financiers typically find it difficult to play because the, the you know, surety of return and, and, and offtake and whether this technology is stable and all these, uh, all these discussions really make it very difficult for them to, uh, to, to then uh, issue a term sheet for a particular project. So generally they concentrated there towards the right bottom end, which is fine. Uh, because that's that's where, where class, uh, classical financiers are playing, but I think we're seeing increasingly a uh, a move from some financiers to actually think a little bit out of the box and move to the to the left top corner. However, um, at the moment, uh, the, uh, the uh, shall we say R and D space, which is one of the, one of the green blocks there, the in the hidden and complex space. Um, for instance, there's, a, there's an incentive at, THRIP called, uh, or at uh, DTI called THRIP, so that has to do with applied research and development work. So that typically could be a space that uh, the DTI could co-fund. It doesn't fund it in total, but obviously with, uh, with uh, private partners, um, uh, researching the application of a particular technology for a particular purpose and an, an environment. And so that, that could be quite helpful, simply because we know very few financial institutions, unless they venture capitalist or you know at that end of the risk curve, they would possibly not be interested. Likewise, the one more or less in the middle top there, what is that, uh, CIP? So that has to do with critical infrastructure that in this case now could mean uh, co-generation um, facility or plant, it could mean um, uh, going with one of the cleaner energies in a particular locality where perhaps it would service three or four uh, tenants. Um, so that typically is what that incentive could do, would typically fund say 50, up to 50, mil, 50 million rands in such a project, uh, d depending on, on some of the, the cost-benefit ratios. So, so there's a bit of a ratio calculation, 40-60, depending on whether it is with a municipal uh, area or within an ACZ, for instance. Um, so that could be quite useful for large-scale energy deployments or technologies, as we previously discussed. Um, and then the other one to the f top right, the noble, the red one here, 
So that's another incentive called SPY, uh, smaller, three to five million, depending on the size of the company, but typically to assist to industrialize a particular process or product. So again, a co-funding mechanism, anywhere from 50 to 100%, uh, depending on who applies for it. And then you've got a range of other interesting ones as well. Um, so the export ones will skip for, what's it, SPP, yeah, there's a supply development one sitting right slap in the middle. So typically co-funding enterprise supply development initiatives, which by the way could include uh, going green on a, on a processing uh, facility or a packaging plant uh, for uh, SME, for instance, supplying into a larger corporate. So that's an interesting one, so about 15 million over three years. Um, yeah, and then obviously the black industrialist one as well, uh, somewhere there in the middle. So simply saying, the, if, you, if you look at it carefully, you'll see one, two, three, four incentives moving in a space where generally you would not find, even even venture capitalists in Santon saying, no, but we feel uneasy about this because there's still some development work that you've got to do. But we previously saw the, the range of options that you have from a technology perspective. So. Um, I, I would argue that I think it's time for one to, to consider some of those those possibilities. I think we're going to skip that one. Can anybody remember this book by Clem Sunter? Saturday night, I was walking my small library and I was looking at this thing and I was thinking, I don't know, it looks like some were born after a certain <laughs> 1993, but so, so I added the megawatt park. I think it, this is simply what, what perhaps Fora was saying. It, it's, um, it, it's clear what one will have to You'll have to uh, to chart your your own roadmap uh, as far as energy uh, independence and then the net cost of it because the, that ultimately drives your end product price, right? And so uh, at some point, you, perhaps you want to export. And with the African Continental Freight Free Trade Agreement um, right in our midst, clearly there must be opportunity to pursue even in other countries, whether in final product form or, or raw product. So, so clearly this issue of uh, at, at what cost it then gets delivered, purely driven by the energy component in there, must become quite relevant. And I think this is what perhaps he tried to say in 1993. In fact, they made a small, there was a little graphic there which looked like a distribution network power generation thing. <laughs> so I was quite amazed that uh, some of the scenario planners, and even, by the way, macroeconomists sometimes are very, very accurate in, uh, in predicting the future. Anyway, in closing, if I may, so um, just a few of my, my thoughts. I think it's clear that uh, perhaps one has uh, reached the, and whether it's this value chain, whether it's a steel value chain, where, whether it's one of the one of the others in the clothing sector, leather, doesn't really uh, matter, but I think uh, a time for, for really in a very intentional, shall we say, strategic leadership across the entire value chain to try and understand, first of all, where one is at from an energy point of view. So the unit cost of energy within the products and services rendered by that particular value chain. Um, and and certainly, as, as I previously mentioned, the, all the political will and all the general support, and by the way, the know-how, interesting know-how in this country, a phenomenal, a phenomenal of, uh, or, or shall we say, completely sort of out-of-the-box innovations that are happening as we speak. Uh, talking, talking to the hydrogen one, for instance, there's a small camp, well, it's not small now, it's now medium, it's been capitalized with overseas venture capitalists, um, develop, developing the catalyst for hydrogen fuel cells here yeah, um, in South Africa, so completely localized. Again, the link back to PGMs, yes, we can use our local uh, platinum that goes into the into the membrane, so well, into the catalyst, so, so that's a logic behind uh, behind that one, um, so so to, to drive that, um, that that sense of can we can we find solution that fits us across the value chain and think holistically, but then at the same time we also further the agenda for localizing this uh, uh, this this technology, which obviously has a range of other benefits um, from point of view of employment creation and all the other all the other upside elements being less dependent on a particular country, a previous point, uh, i.e. a China for lithium-ion batteries, I think, uh, I don't know, that, that just remains a red flag for me. Um, the other one is, as Fora mentioned, clearly there's this, then it would be advisable to prioritize the existing sort of really, we got to do this now type uh, solutions. So, uh, and, and having said that, to then be mindful of what is already sitting in the value chain that potentially is being wasted. 
So I think you referred to that uh, as well, Fora. So that would be a logic, uh, logic cho uh, choice, um, I would imagine. I think over the medium long term, if we want to consider some of these other emerging technologies, again, I, I need to be careful to be too biased. But in my view, um, hydrogen, pff, uh, it's a no-brainer. So anything related to hydrogen, um, air uh, on storage side, <laughs> air compressor, vanadium flow batteries at scale, larger scale applications for sure. Uh, why? Because we have access to all the raw material that's required for them. We don't have to import it. Um, and we have uh, sufficient technological capability locally to actually produce and, and, and support those technologies going forward. And then obviously, uh, yeah, the, the one that I would certainly favor over the medium term, um, small modular reactors. I know there are a lot of people very anti this, uh, this focus. It's coming. So, uh, so for one or two larger applications down the line, I'm sure it's going to be part of the uh, part of the solution. So, in closing, uh, I, I think uh, Fora mentioned it. I don't think it's a technology issue. I don't think it's an issue of not being able to do know what and, and how to put together this puzzle of which technologies will work now and a bit later in medium term. In my humble opinion, I think it's all about us battling to get the financial industry to play to, to, to really play ball and understand the magnitude of the opportunity, but also being able to to, to properly um, understand and price for the risk involved in some of these technologies that are really on our doorstep, but at the moment find it difficult to, to get commercialized or, or commissioned simply because of financial um, financial hurdles that um, the, the, that currently prevail in our current, shall we say, financial ecosystem. That, that's my personal point of view. Obviously, that together with with harnessing what is really wasted somewhere in the anywhere in the value chain, um, quite correct as Fora said. And lastly, also remember from an energy efficiency point of view, there's another agency called NCPC. I don't know whether any of you may have had contact with them, National Clean Production Centre. They, for instance, would would would, would assist you with. Um, um, with uh, very quick and, in, in some cases, free assessments on, on how to improve energy. Am, am I correct on the free side? I'm not sure they partly. Okay, so some, a, some, some, a, 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 a co-payment, but essentially assisting one to properly assess what could be improved from an efficiency point of view. That obviously would be, um, would be one's recommendation over the immediate term. I think that's about it. Okay, thank you.